Are super rich people actually happy? Year, and that includes closing down tax havens around Britain and in British territories, as well as around Europe, such as Monaco and, uh, and Luxembourg. Yes, so what power do you have to close Monaco? We don't. So you've got no problem with somebody coming from abroad as a migrant with five kids, say, and claiming five lots of child tax credits, five lots of child benefits, housing benefit. People and children. No limits on their benefits. People and children come first. I don't see that as a problem because 60%? what? Sixty percent. No, I mean, I mean, you put figures, do you go 50, yeah. 60, 70? Yeah. You can't if it's a long, no. long answer. Look, the, not... issue is, the issue is this. You are not prepared to discuss the whole issue of the Middle East. You're not prepared to discuss the wider question. I mean, you, you have been an MP since 1983. Uh, but perhaps, are, are you more in a, not so much the Westminster bubble, but are you in a kind of Trotskyite bubble of your own? To be able to pay properly their share of the needs of the rest of the community. But they wouldn't be... Do you regard yourself as a Marxist? That's a very interesting question, actually. I haven't thought about that Thank for you. a long time. Jeremy, what qualifies you to be Prime Minister? You've never run anything. You've never run a union. You've never run a council. You've, you've been misreading what was miswritten in some of the papers what, today. What, what People opinion? were very confused. To... Where does that figure come from? From research that I've had done for me. From a by whom? By very clever people. Not the IFS, not, not the OBR. Either. You think you're bringing a lot less. The fact, the fact that you no, haven't minute, run anything since 1978, I mean, shows a distinct lack of ambition, wouldn't you say? What is ambition? So if anything, you would want more than 50p, wouldn't you? Yes, of course. Uh, ultimately, you may need to go higher, but I think that... that much? I'm not putting a figure on that. Investing in people, in education, in childcare, in benefit system, all those things which actually provides for a vibrant economy. In benefit system, in benefit system, in benefit system, all those things which actually provides for a vibrant economy. But uh, can, I, can, I, can, I, can you allow me to finish? Uh, well, Do you mind? Yeah, but I asked you a question and you're no. ignoring it. No, I'm not ignoring the question. If you'd give me a minute, I'll answer it. I, the I point is, you, is the point is this. Friends? Listen for a minute, if you don't mind. Sorry? What happens if they just went independent? Well, if they go independent, that's their choice. But, mm -hmm. no, but you would, wouldn't close them then, down then, as a tax haven. Well, yeah, hang on a minute. Why did you call Hamas and Hezbollah your friends? Now, Jeremy Corbyn, you've invited Hezbollah, Hamas, the IRA to Parliament in the past. You've called them your friends. Is there any terrorist group beyond the pill for a cosy chat on the House of Commons terrorists with you? Now, on Northern Ireland, you didn't just deal with Sinn Féin. You dealt with the IRA three I'm... weeks after the Brighton bomb, in which the IRA had tried to destroy the democratically elected government of this country. You invited two convicted IRA terrorists to the House of Commons. They were former prisoners who had come out of prison, women who had come out of prison, came to Parliament, actually in a meeting that had been arranged long before, to talk about prison conditions and rehabilitation of prisoners. They is were there, IRA. Is there, is there anything wrong with that since they had a spent conviction? They had surely, just, their organisation had just tried to surely, blow up the British Andrew, government. I mean, essentially, well, Conservatives and UKIP got half the total vote. UKIP Labour, is a devil SNP, make, Greens, yeah. they didn't get as much as Conservative and UKIP. It UKIP is a devil may care vote. It's also motivated to some extent by racism. Uh, You're going to need to get some of those UKIP voters back. Who incidentally you've just asserted a, a no, racist in I some know, cases? No, in some cases, but, yeah. But, but, it's the general he's a, he's a racist scumbag trying to blame immigrants <laughs> for the car banks because uh, of his rich bank of rights. I haven't really read as much of Marx as I should have done. I've read quite a bit, but not that much. And I think Marx's um, transition of history and the an analysis of how you go from feudalism to capitalism and move on to a, a different stage is fascinating. So we all owe something to it. Probably inside you, even you do. I can't think of a better person to talk about uh, British politics than our guest today. Uh, Eamon Butler is the executive director of the Adam Smith Institute, which he co-founded around the time that Greg Lindsay co-founded the Centre for Independent Studies. He's also author of several acclaimed books on legendary free marketeers, uh, Friedman, Hayek and von Mises. Ladies and gentlemen, Eamon Butler. Thank you very much. Eamon, um, before I ask the first question, uh, let's get a sense of Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Last week, uh, like him, I was in Brussels meeting with uh, heads of government and leaders of European socialist parties, one of whom said to me, No, 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 what, 
they said. What they said, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> uh, Eamon, who is Jeremy Corbyn? Oh, I honestly don't know why you're obsessed with this man. He's a puff of wind. Um, uh, he, he's a, a radical international socialist. He's fundamentally um, a Leninist. Um, he has come to uh, power in his own party because the rules of the Labour Party were changed to keep out anybody like Blair. Uh, and so now they've got the complete uh, opposite. Instead of a centrist, they've got an extremist. Um, and uh, in the election, although it was talked up as a, a disaster for uh, Mrs. May, which indeed it was through to a, because of her own incompetence, he's still 60 seats behind the Conservatives, and we're going to have redistricting shortly, which is going to give the Conservatives another 15 or, or maybe even 20 uh, seats. So you know, he's you know, if anybody's taking bets or in business, um, you know, he is not going to become the uh, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, so I really don't know why you're obsessed with it. Well, uh, to be fair, uh, you know, three decades ago, one of our ideological and political heroes was Margaret Thatcher. She was a transformative figure, so much so that she, um, she made sure that Labor under Tony Blair could not resist the gravitational pull to the free market right. Tony Blair, of course, knew Labor, triangulation, small, uh, smaller government, more efficient free markets and whatnot. Um, how do you account then for the fact that the centre of political and ideological gravity has shifted towards the more interventionist left? Well, I, I think there are two different uh, things going on here. Um, firstly, I think people are voting against established politicians. And I'm with them, frankly, because the established politicians um, have carved it up for their own benefit. This is why uh, Corbyn has some resonance. He's absolutely right. Yes, it's a cosy, um, a, a corporatist uh, economy, uh, and uh, the, the politicians are in league with the business people, and they're in league with the media and all the rest of it. And it's a sort of political class. And most of the great British public, and I, th I think probably most of the public in the United States, most of the public in Europe, just don't feel as if they're part of that political class. So they're rebelling against it. They're voting for Trump in, in uh, America. They're voting for Brexit um, in the UK. They're voting against the uh, Conservatives in the UK. They're voting for extremist parties in Germany. Um, all over the world, this is happening. And it's just it's a sea change in politics that we actually have to get used to. You mentioned Bernie Sanders uh, yeah, on the left yeah. and the Democrat Party. Of course, in yeah. France, there was a near miss by Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who was a far left, uh, some mm -hmm. say a communist. He came very close in the first round of those French elections a year ago. Yeah. Um, is there an argument to be made that honest socialism appeals to a lot of ordinary working folks who have been displaced by globalisation? Um, no, because I, well, certainly I can only speak for my own, my own country. In my own country, um, th th there's a sort of tension, which is that uh, globalisation means, right, we're getting cheap goods from all over the world, or cheaper goods from all over the world. Um, the European Union is a bit of a barrier to that, but we are doing that. We're getting uh, lots of uh, people coming in from Eastern Europe who are extremely good um, plumbers and electricians and cleaners and all sorts of things like that, so, so we benefit from that. Um, so we see that there are uh, benefits of this, but at the same time, you know, way, huge waves of immigration, it, it does, does rankle. Um, so uh, we're, we're a bit tense about that. But I, I wouldn't say that it's people um, flooding towards a sort of revolutionary socialism. I don't think that's, that's what's happening at all. People don't vote for governments, they vote against them. And they voted for, against Mrs May's government because it was completely and hopelessly, impossibly useless. <laughs> Owen, Owen Jones uh, from The Guardian newspaper, a young millennial he's socialist. He's not as young as he claims to be. But yeah. right. <laughs> he looks young, but he's not. In actually. the aftermath of the British election in July, June, July last year, he says that millions were inspired by a radical manifesto that promised to transform Britain, to attack injustices and challenge the vested interests holding the country back. Owen Jones went on to say, people believe the booming well-off should pay more, that we should invest that money in schools, hospitals, houses, police, public services, that in all work should have a genuine living wage and young people should not be saddled with debt for aspiring to an education that our utilities should be under the control of the people of this country. 
Now, Owen Jones does reflect the thoughts and attitudes of a lot of these British millennials, correct? Owen Jones is another puff of wind. And, <laughs> and, and, and his, uh, you know, his parents were university professors and all the rest, so he's not, he's not remotely working, doesn't remotely reflect the working class. People like me that actually reflect the working class, my, my dad was a mechanic. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so we know what it's like to be, to, to be poor. He's never suffered that kind of stuff, so he doesn't know about it. It's just ideological. And I think you've got all this ideological cant coming out. Um, and, yeah, you, you know, the, the point is, of course, that there's just a sort of kernel of truth that you can, you can build something around, that people do feel that the political system is not working for them, that it, it works for the boss classes, it works for the politicians, uh, they've got a nice cushy life, and the rest of us you know, aren't really getting, getting a say. Um, so, absolutely, there, there, there is something in that. Now, Corbyn is widely seen as a radical and his disciples see, him as, see himself as a radical. Tell us about his foreign policy. Well, he's a pacifist. He believes that um, no wars since 1945 have been justified. He uh, is against intervention in uh, Syria and the uh, Middle, Middle East. Um, he thinks that NATO should be disbanded, but at the same time he has sufficient political realism uh, to think that, well, that's not actually going to happen, so he wants uh, NATO to, to be reined back. And uh, he thinks that NATO was responsible for the crisis in Crimea where the Russians invaded. But to be He's fair, that, that, wrong that, that that's one, more or less Donald Trump's position and the view of a lot of foreign policy realists, that NATO was a, a creature of the Cold War, it was designed to contain Soviet communism. Surely a quarter of a century later, uh, there's not such a strategic rationale for NATO, so doesn't Corbyn have a point? Well, we want to keep the Americans online, you know. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the Europeans don't spend enough on defence. I mean, they're right in the front line, and, it, uh, and it's the UK, France to a certain extent, and America that spend money on defence. So, that, I mean, that's a real problem. And, and, and what Trump is saying, basically, I th you know, Trump is, I, I believe, I don't know, I've never met the man, but I believe that he actually, of course, supports... NATO, but what he's trying to do, it's like he's, he's doing to many other world leaders, is to give them a bit of a fright and to say, well, you know, you guys in Denmark, yeah. you guys in Poland, you guys in Germany and so on, you really ought to be spending a lot more money on defence because at mm. the moment we're carrying it all yeah. and Britain's carrying it all, yeah. which is true. Uh, why did Jeremy Corbyn invite representatives of Hamas and Hezbollah uh, to events at the Houses of Parliament and even call them friends? Uh, there's two sides to that. The Labour Party has a problem with Israel, uh, and they've had a lot of soul-searching on this. And the, uh, there is an argument that they are very anti-Israeli, um, anti-Zionist, sort of and they've had s internal reports into their own party um, uh, to, to try to, to change this. So there's, there is that kind of undertow um, in Labour Party thinking. Uh, but also, um, you know, Corbyn is the sort of, he's, you know, he is an international socialist and he believes in international socialism and these guys believe in international socialism. So he invites them to the House of Commons and he invites the IRA to the House of Commons because, or he did, because, you know, um, they're against this Im imperial power, Britain, you know, occupying Ireland and all mm. that kind of stuff. So he, you know, he, he positions himself as being on the side of the, the underdog and that he will speak to uh, anybody who will um, discuss rationally. But uh, at the same time, a certain pattern, I have to say, is... Yeah. Uh, building up that he's talking to lots of very unsavoury people. You know, I mean, it, it, it strikes me that uh, uh, Jeremy Corman, uh, obviously radical on the left, the last time the British Labour Party elected as their leader a radical left-wing figure was Michael Foote yes. in 1983, who was yeah. annihilated by Margaret Thatcher in that year's general election. Yeah. Um, but could you argue that the, um, the ideological and economic trends are less friendly to the West today than they were uh, 30 years ago? Um, well, I think, I don't know, I, th I, think, I think the free market ideology is strong. 
and I don't think that it is being supported by our politicians. I think certainly the difficulty that we have in Europe in general, but certainly in the UK, is that we have politicians who are professional politicians. They've never had an outside job in their lives. I can explain why that should be. But they've never had a proper job in their lives. Um, they don't know how business works. They don't know how, how ordinary people live. They are professional politicians. Uh, they, they, they leave school. Uh, they become involved in a university political club. They join a, a trade union or uh, they join a, a, a PR agency if they're Tories. Um, and then they, 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 they take a, they, they, they take, take a, uh, uh, a job as a counsellor, and then they, that's right, and then they, then they get uh, a job as a, you know, they fight a bad seat, and then they fight a good seat, and then they become a junior minister and a senior minister. They've never actually seen the real world. They've never actually had a proper job in their lives. Uh, and so it's not surprising that those people are estranged from the great British public, and it's no surprising the great British public is saying, well, up your bum. You know, Margaret Thatcher once uh, slapped down a copy of a Frederick Hayek book on the cabinet round table and she told her front bench colleagues at number 10 Downing Street, this is what we believe in. How have we gone from that moment <laughs> to the moment where the shadow chancellor, the shadow treasurer in Britain, uh, John McConnell, will praise the works of Karl Marx's Das Capital and say this in the House of Commons? To assist Comrade Osborne in his dealings with his newfound comrades, I brought him along Mao's little red book. <laughs> Let me quote. Let me quote, Mr. Speaker. I, order. I, I want to hear about the contents of the book. I think you'll find. I think you'll find this invaluable. <coughs> well. Let me offer. I thought this would help him, Mr. Speaker. Let's quote from Mao. Rarely done in this chamber. The quote is this. <laughs> Behave. We must learn to do economic work from all who know how. No matter who they are, we must esteem them as teachers, learning from them respectfully and conscientiously. But we must not to pretend to know what we do not know. I thought it would come in handy for him in his new relationship. So the Shadow Chancellor literally stood at the dispatch box and read out from Mao's little red book. And look, it's his personal signed copy. <laughs> the problem is, half the shadow cabinet have been sent off to re-education. <laughs> George Osborne, the then Tory uh, Chancellor. Uh, Eamon Butler, how do you account for the fact we've gone from Hayek to Mao in 30 years? You know, McConnell is the dangerous one. Uh, you know, forget Corbyn, right? He looks like a sort of international socialist from the 60s, and he is an international socialist from the 60s. McConnell looks like a businessman. He speaks like a business person. Uh, he's, he wears nice suits and ties, uh, and he always sounds extremely moderate, but he's a bloody international Marxist. Mm. And, uh, so, you know, so, so, he is, so, if, so if, if Corbyn fell under a bus, uh, then... That would be, uh, I think, I think a real problem. Um, so he, he's more Marxist than Jeremy Corbyn, then? <laughs> no, he's just more slippery, more electable, more uh, mm. nicer and smoother, and knows what to say and and how to to present these things. You know, he still believes in nationalising all the industries and, um, and 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 supporting the trade unions <coughs> and doing doing all of that stuff that got us into the problems in the first place. But uh, yeah. you know, he's a problem. Now you mentioned that the Tories have clearly failed to refute the Corbyn agenda. Um, why haven't the Conservatives today explained to the public? as Margaret Thatcher all too often did uh, throughout the 70s and 80s and early 90s, the profound connection between smaller government and greater individual freedom. Yeah, well, 
One reason is because they're all professional politicians. So they have an interest in keeping government large. And they might say, yes, we believe in smaller government. But they're not very enthusiastic about cutting, cutting it back. Uh, an another reason, I think, is that our democracy has changed. That um, I believe in democracy. I think it's an extremely good way of deciding a few things that you can't actually decide by any other means. But it's a very bad way of deciding everything. And the trouble is, we're always told democracy is wonderful, great system, fabulous. And our politicians say it's a brilliant system. And, and so the argument is, well, whatever issue comes up, we should have more democracy. We should mm. decide it um, uh, by the democratic process. And if it's health care, we decide it democratically. If it's education, we decide it democratically. Um, welfare, yes, absolutely. So. What's happening, of course, is that that means that we decide things democratically. In other words, we decide it politically. Mm. So, and this is spread. And the politicians don't have the sort of ideological understanding of classical liberalism, which makes, would make them realize, no, there are limits to this. You, democracy, politics, is a bad way of deciding how big your Coca-Cola bottle should be. It's not, that's not what it's about, or, or, or whether people should be able to, s to smoke in their own home or, or take drugs or, or anything else. It's not the way to do that. But a simple question, does Theresa May, the Prime Minister, believe in free markets or in controlling them? Uh, she doesn't. <coughs> she's not against free markets, but she is a managerialist just as Cameron was a managerialist. And it, th this runs very deep in the Tory party, and it's been, I've been watching it for the last 45 years. And there, there is, you know, the uh, Labour, the left come up, and they say, we've got this agenda, and it's finding the wonderful workers' paradise, and all that sort of stuff. And the Tories think, well, you know, perhaps we could just hold it a bit and, and slow it down a bit. So there's a sort of ratchet like that. And then they s the Tories sort of regard their role as being to manage the economy, vote for us because we can manage things better than others. So they've lost that, you know, since Mrs. Thatcher, they've, they've lost that ideology. But Mrs. Thatcher was an exception, right? Mm. I mean, most politicians are useless. <coughs> Mrs. Thatcher was incredible. And, you know, we've been very lucky, actually, with our politicians in the UK. We, I mean, we had Churchill, I mean, fine. Attlee, you could say, was a brilliant politician. Mm. Even though he was even a socialist. Even though he was a socialist, he nationalised everything and ended up with strikes everywhere, but he was a gr you know, <laughs> brilliant politician. <laughs> uh, and then we had you know, Mrs Thatcher, then we had Blair, who again was a sort of centrist, um, but again, you know, stuck in for more than 10 years, uh, and, and he could just handle things. Um, but these are, these are the exception. Most mm. politicians just you know, are drifting, and, and so government gets bigger and bigger, and there's no real ideology to rein it back. And they, they, they think, well, we can manage all this, and you know, we can manage it better than the other guys. Yeah, when the, um, the Labour-dominated government uh, in the city of London, uh, in a classic left-wing regulatory collision act, uh, they decided to heed the pleas of all the taxi drivers by putting a ban <laughs> on Uber. This was late last year. Um, where was Theresa May and the Conservatives making the case for free markets? My former colleagues at The Spectator said, why didn't the Tories explain how deregulation, remember Uber's part of that process, why didn't the Tories explain how deregulation leads to more choices for consumers and more economic opportunities for workers. How come the Tories didn't make that case? This is managerialism again, and, and, and it's something that you find in professional politicians. As I say, politicians who've never actually driven a taxi or, or run an Uber or, or started a business or whatever. Um, and uh, but they were nowhere. I use Uber all the time. And, and you know, I, I use In Uber. London? Oh, yeah. But how can you do that? I, because it's still going. I mean, there was. But isn't it bad? Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> they've, they've, they've tried. They've tried, and, and the taxi drivers have, have brought you know London, the central London, to a halt on two occasions. But they haven't yet got it because there's a, like two million people in London who use the damn thing. Yeah. So <laughs> you, you've got a constituency there. And I use it just so I can stand on the street corner looking at my phone, waiting for the Uber to come with all the taxis, the, the black taxis coming. I go, yeah. <laughs> and and so, so, so I love it. But no, it, it was wor it's worse. It's worse than what you say. Because what happened is that the, the government, faced with this um, you know, Airbnb 
and, and Uber and all of these other sharing economy things. What did they do? They set up somebody to review the so-called gig economy. And who did they get to do it? They got the guy who his father was a Marxist who appeared on the BBC all the time and had his own radio show. The guy himself ran the biggest left-wing think tank, and then he graduated to the uh, Royal Society of Arts, which is a very grand organization, but then he started to run that. And they appointed him to do a report on the gig economy and how it should be managed and what regulations there should be. And I thought, you stupid... You know, <laughs> what, what answer do you think yeah. is going to come out? And the answer that comes out well, people who work, you know, in Uber and so on, they deserve um, nine weeks holiday just like everybody else, and uh, they, they deserve, uh, you know, their, their rights to be written out and, and, and so on. No, they don't. Right. Yeah, they're, 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 they're driving cars. Or, or Airbnb, you know, you know, again, under the pressure from the hotel lobby, uh, a lot of people are, are saying, well, Airbnb, you know, they ought to be regulated and you ought to have standards and all the rest of it. You know, not realizing that the yeah. web does this. The web regulates these things. But what about the, the point about the power of ideas and authenticity? I mean, this is what the commentary in Britain Absolutely. are saying about Corbyn and McConnell, yes. that they're genuine, yes. they yeah. are authentic, Absolutely. they're true believers, they're Absolutely. rallying against an establishment Absolutely. that is out of touch with the thoughts and attitudes yeah. of middle Britain. Yeah. Um, James Bartholomew uh, is a former venture capitalist yeah, who I now writes a brilliant column in the Daily Telegraph. He will be a guest here at CIS later this year, I think in October, as our scholar in residence. He raises the question, why can't the Tories embrace their own best instincts on reform and deregulation with the same enthusiasm and authenticity as, as the Corbynistas, uh, as they embrace Labor's worst impulses on taxes and spending? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, I wish. Uh, as I say, I think the Tories, uh, there's this very deep thing in the psyche of the, of the Conservatives that we are better management managers than the other guys. So, you know, let us manage and we will manage. And it's kind of managed decline, actually. Um, and there's very few people who have the ideological background. Oh, we, we're, we're trying. But I, uh, but I think that with 24-7 um, you know, professional politicians, that's extremely difficult yeah. to do. You know, I would love to see term limits and so on. So you can't make a career out of politics. So you've actually got to do a proper job and then you understand how these things when work. When Theresa May was elected Tory leader mm. after the Brexit vote, uh, and leading up to uh, May when she called last year's general election, uh, the, the, she was overwhelming favourite to win a landslide election, <laughs> uh, a la Ronald Reagan in 1984. It didn't pan out that way, and everything's yes. been going downhill ever since. Yeah. Let's look at her, um, some of the key, po the key moments from the Tory party conference speech she delivered late last year. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> while our opponents flirt with a foreign policy of neutrality and prepare for a run on the ground. Some people say we've spent too much time talking about Jeremy Corbyn's past. You may not have heard me say that. So some people say we've spent too much time talking about Jeremy Corbyn's past. I was, a, I was about to talk about somebody I'd like to give a P45 to, and that's Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. The public sector working together, we have bounced back. We've created record numbers of jobs. <coughs> so, why, <coughs> why we will never, <coughs> excuse me, we will never hesitate to act where businesses aren't operating as they should. Let this party celebrate the wealth creators, the risk takers, the innovators and entrepreneurs. <laughs> <coughs> and strength that was shared around the... And strength that was shared around the... Oh. 
Well, uh, can you think of a, a, a worse debacle uh, for a, uh, a no, political leader? Uh, no, how do you account for the fact that she's declined so dramatically in such a short period of time? I think it's very difficult when you've got a very slim majority. <coughs> I mean, okay, she uh, fought an election with um, prospects of winning a larger majority, which is the reason that she called it, so that she would have a, a strong bargaining uh, uh, case for uh, um, Brexit. And um, uh, she did everything wrong. The manifesto was fundamentally written by a couple of people in Downing Street who uh, were with her when she was Home Secretary. I didn't know them. They, they hadn't come through the movement at all. I didn't know them even as Conservatives. They were sort of apparatchiks, and then she took them to Downing Street, and they basically wrote the, wrote the manifesto without checking it with any ministers. You know, our ministers mm. might actually have an interest in the policy for their department. They might actually have uh, um, an idea as to what policies are likely to go down well with the electorate and not. But no, you know, she got these guys to write that, that manifesto. So that was uh, an absolute disaster. And she just did, did everything wrong. And then now you've got the situation, it's a bit like the situation that we had with John Major when he had a majority of just 20. Um, and if you've got a majority of 20, it only takes, takes 10 troublemakers mm. to bring you down. And so you've got to give in to everybody. You've got to try and be nice to everybody. You've got to try and hold everybody together, even though they're fighting and they've got different views. It's an, it's an impossible course, situation What complicates matters, too, is the, um, the countdown for the British withdrawal from the European Union. Yeah, sure. It's next year. Yeah, just What's your position year. on Brexit, Eamon? Well, uh, in 1974... Um, when we had a referendum on whether we should stay in the European Union, I was actually in favour of staying. I was, I was only a nipper at the time. But so was uh, Margaret Thatcher too, by the way, correct? She supported the sure. common market I in the mid-70s? I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Well, we were sold, sold it as being a common, common market. Meaning free trade. R yeah, that's right, R rather than a political And that's why people union. like Jeremy Corbyn and political the left union. of the British Labour Party opposed the European Union or mm. the British inclusion in the common market, correct? Well, I... In the yeah. 70s? In the 70s, yes, they, yes, absolutely right. Yes, they, they saw it as, uh, you know, they wanted to run Britain as a socialist paradise. Mm. We wanted to get Britain into the European Union precisely because we thought it would stop us becoming a socialist paradise or, or, or hell, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, so, so I was actually on the board of the Young European Federalists, if you can believe that. Um, and now I'm older than, and wiser. And I think that basically, under the Blair years, I thought, right, this is it. This, it's changed, right? It's become very much more of a political union. Yeah. Blair signed us up to all of this regulation on the work, workplace and the social chapter and all of this kind of stuff. And I thought, no, the, the, there were benefits from being a member of a bigger, bigger market. Oh, uh, that's, uh, that's all. Yeah, John Howard, the former Australian Prime Minister at the height of the uh, famous um, uh, asylum seeker standoff in 2001, famously said, uh, we will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they, they yeah. come. Do you think that message resonated with a, a large chunk of the British people in the lead up to the Brexit vote? Uh, I, I, to be honest, I think it did. And I, you know, I, I sort of slightly <coughs> regret the... The, the way the campaign went, the the, the campaign you know originated um, talking about um, markets and the and the regulation that we have and the fact that we have huge trade uh, barriers with the outside world, including uh, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, especially on things like agricultural goods, um, and and that was great. And then the, the the argument sort of turned to be kind of slightly anti-immigration, which I, I don't, I'm not very comfortable with. Mm. But at the same time, I mean, I think I can see that the great British public have a point, mm. which is that why should we, uh, why should we <coughs> admit anybody from 400 million people in the United, in, in the European Union, <laughs> any of those 400 million people have the right to come to the UK and, and stay and work and, and, and live there. And we've got no controls over it. We just have to accept it. Why shouldn't we say, right, you know, if we need more nurses, uh, there's a whole world out there. We need more doctors. You know, India <coughs> produces great doctors. Why don't we get, mm. you know, them in? So a lot of the Brexiteers uh, saw the Brexit vote as a, as a reaffirmation of national sovereignty. Your argument yes. is more a classical liberal one that... Um, 
you know, Britain's future trading partners should be global and not confined to Brussels and, and the continent. Do you see expanded British trade relations with Australia in the coming uh, decade? Oh, definitely, yes. I mean, I, mean, I, I think that... Uh, w one of the arguments in 74 was, oh, well, you know, we're going to have to have barriers against New, New Zealand butter and lamb mm. and all of that kind of stuff Australian, and yep. Australian goods. Daniel Hannan has actually spoken about that very issue here a few ah, years ago. Yep. Right. And, and so, <coughs> you know, people were nervous about it at the time. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, m more recently, I, I think the, the, the Brexiteer, I, uh, you know, we don't, I'm, I'm a Brexiteer. I think we should leave tomorrow without a deal. I couldn't care less about a deal. I think we should get out. Um, what about if you don't get a free trade agreement I in don't exchange? Care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But, that, what, but, the, but the conventional wisdom, though, I mean, would be that if you don't get a free trade deal with no. Brussels and Britain leaves the European Union, you're going to uh, downgrade a growth forecast. No. Absolute nonsense. Look, you're, you've been listening to the rubbish Treasury. <laughs> 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 the, the Treasury, before, before the Brexit vote, said that we're going to have an economic disaster. The place is booming. <laughs> right? It's growing faster than anywhere in Europe. Uh, people are investing there. Okay, yeah, sure. One or two companies have, have relocated uh, some people to, um, to the continent just in case. But other, other companies are investing. Yeah, but then again, can I just put you on the spot here? Why doesn't Theresa May and her senior ministers, especially her chancellor, Philip Hammond, Hammond uh, lead the charge for lower taxes and deregulation to encourage a post-Brexit investment boom? I never hear this. I wish they would. What, what they're stuck with is, you know, we, we, we're trying to negotiate a deal with the European Union. As I say, I think it would be better if we didn't negotiate, if we just left and then we could leave on our own terms and turn the whole ruddy country into a tax haven. But um, if you are trying to, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> if you are, if you're trying to uh, do a deal with the European Union, now the first thing they say is, well, when you leave, don't try uh, making yourself a tax haven, mate, or you'll know, be real trouble. <laughs> um, so they they are desperately trying to stop Britain from reducing corporation tax, for example, which I think should be zero mm. because two-thirds of corporation tax is actually paid by workers and customers. It isn't paid by the boss classes. Uh, and, uh, you know, we want to do all of these things, but we're in negotiations and the argument is, oh, well, you know, we have to be nice to them and, uh, and so on. So that's, that's the reason. Now, now, some will say that the only forceful, uh, true-believing exponent of Brexit in the Tory front bench is uh, the former mayor of Morris. London... Former Mayor of London, the former editor of The Spectator, uh, now front bencher, Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. Let's hear from Boris. Yeah. <laughs> we will continue to go uh, on cheapo flights to, to stag parties in uh, ancient uh, cities, where we will receive, a, I'm sure, a warm welcome. I meet interesting people, fall in love, struggle amiably to learn the other European lab languages uh, whose, uh, whose knowledge of which, by the way, has suffered a paradoxical decline. Uh, during our membership of the EU. And there's no sensible reason why we should not continue to be able to retire to, uh, to Spain uh, or indeed anywhere else, as we did indeed long before Spain joined uh, what was then called the common market. Uh, we can continue the whirl of academic exchanges that have been a feature of European uh, cultural life since the Middle Ages. Brexit is about re-engaging this country with its global identity and all the energy that can flow from that. And I absolutely refuse to accept the suggestion that it is some un-British spasm of bad manners. It's not some great V sign from the cliffs of Dover. It is to fulfill the liberal idealism of John Stuart Mill himself, who recognised that it is only the nation, as he put it, united among themselves by common sympathies which do not exist between themselves and others, only the nation could legitimate the activities of the state. Uh, what do you make of Boris, his argument about Brexit, and more intriguingly, is he capable of being the next Tory leader and as a result Prime Minister? Uh, he's absolutely right on Brexit. We want to leave the European Union. We want to leave a network of regulations and controls and way of government. Uh, we don't want to leave Europe. We're a part of Europe. We've always been a part of Europe. And people say, oh, well, with Brexit, you will, you know, you'll need a visa to go to France. Absolute nonsense. I used to go to France with a, like a little 
piece of cardboard <laughs> uh, that didn't even have my picture on it, and, and you could go. Uh, called a, a British visitor's passport, and uh, uh, you know, so we had we had very liberal immigration and all that. We we got on famously. We had cooperation and all the rest of it, uh, and then we had the EU, which which is a, a way of governing all of this stuff. And it's just you know we've got enough government. We don't want any more government. Thanks very much. And we certainly don't want any more regulation. Mm -hmm. And we don't want the European sort of legal system, which is a top-down Napoleonic system, whereas ours is is a common law system. Um, it, it's, it's liberal, uh, you do what you like, and then if it causes a trouble, then we'll pass a law, as opposed to the continental system, which is you can't do anything unless there's a law saying you can. And that's corroded our, our legal system. So we want out of, out of that, but we want to be part of Europe. Yeah, because it, what's the problem? And we want, we want people to come to Britain from Europe, and we want Brits to go, go to Europe, and we want to do trade. Um, it's fantastic. Why, why don't we do that? What about Boris's political prospects? Because Theresa May is widely seen as damaged goods. Um, Boris Johnson is obviously popular in London, but to what extent does he resonate with the Tory movement more broadly? Well, as I said, my, you know, my wife joined uh, the Tories just because she thought he was the greatest hope since, since Thatcher, which is going back a, a way. And um, I, I think at that point, had he won that uh, leadership election instead of withdrawing, his, which is what he did against Theresa May, 2016, um, that um, you know he could have been the party leader. Now, of course, you know we've seen him as a minister, and he's not a minister. He's Boris, right? And he, you know, he's just got his way of doing things, and everybody goes, "Oh no, what's he going to say yeah, next?" Yeah. Um, so I don't think he's actually a credible leader. But but then. There's not going to be a leadership election anytime soon because the Tories are absolutely terrified of having an election. Because if they had a leadership election, the first thing that would happen is everybody would say, the BBC particularly, would be saying, well, you know, whoever won this election has got no mandate. You know, when yeah. the Tories going to go and uh, get a mandate from the people, so we'd have another election. And the Tories, you know, having had one referendum and uh, two elections in no time would not do very yeah, well. Yeah, it sounds a bit like the Liberal Party here in Australia with our leadership turmoil. Um, mm. But uh, a little aside, did you know that um, Theresa May, uh, Emmanuel Macron, and listened to her recently, Malcolm Turnbull, our Prime Minister, um, Angela Merkel in Germany, they have lower approval ratings than one Donald Trump. <laughs> Max Hastings uh, is a very distinguished British historian and journalist, and he was Boris's boss for many years at mm. the Daily Telegraph. Oh, that's right. He had this to say uh, about Boris just recently. Boris is a man who is obliged to pay for extra weight at airports because of all the skeletons in his luggage. Mm. <laughs> many of them, those of women he has betrayed. When he first considered, I'm saying this because of the context of uh, Barnaby Joyce, of course. <laughs> When he first considered running for London Mayor back in 2008, he took me, Max Hastings, to lunch and asked if I could offer any advice. This is Max Hastings, who's a distinguished historian. Sir Max, Boris, you need to, quote, lock up your willy. <laughs> Max goes on to say, it seemed to me that he could not credibly step onto a big, big political stage unless he was willing to abandon his career of manic sexual adventuring. What was at stake was not morality, which I've absolutely no claim to pontificate about, but rather the need to practice a self-discipline that is vital to any successful political career. Eamon Butler on Max Hastings. Uh, yes, I don't think that self-discipline is Boris's big thing, I have to say. Uh, I, think the, I think the British public are um, quite forgiving on these things up to a point. Uh, that We sort of think that this is your private life and... Uh, um, you, you should get on with it, unless you're being hypocritical. I mean, if you're so, talking about family values and all that stuff, and then it turns out you have a love, love child, that, that, that's a different thing. And, and um, uh, John Major got into difficulties on that kind of thing because his slogan was uh, uh, back to basics. And then, of course, the first um, sexual scandal there was in, in his cabinet, then, uh, you know, oh, back to basics, eh? Ha, ha, ha. Um, and so uh, you lose a lot of credibility doing that. I mean, everybody knows what Boris is like, and they know about his background, and I think they sort of think, well, that's for him to sort out. It's not, uh, it's not, not a political okay. issue. Now it's time for Q&A, and our first question will come from Blaise Joseph, my colleague from the Centre for Independent Studies. 
Thank you, Dr. Butler. Uh, if you don't mind, we might go back to Jeremy Corbyn, if you don't mind. Um, why do you think the criticisms of Corbyn have been apparently ineffective? I mean, if his policies are really so crazy, what is it about the attacks on him which haven't worked? Do you think perhaps it's because they've been a tiny bit too condescending and that they're implying that anyone who's thinking of voting for him is stupid um, and that has the effect of making people think, well, hang on, I'm not stupid. How dare you imply I'm stupid? Mm. Here's a double finger, I'm going to vote for him twice. Um, similar to perhaps the, the attitude towards Trump voters. Um, so if you could give your thoughts on that, that'd be great, thank you. All of that is true. Uh, I think that Corbyn's appeal is the fact that he is a very natural person. I mean, I, I've never met him one-to-one, -one, but I, I've sort of seen him in the House of Commons taking groups around and all the rest of it. And he's, he's obviously just such a nice guy um, and he's such an on honest guy. He actually you know, believes in all of this stuff. I think this is all crazy, but he <laughs> believes in it. And you can see that he believes in it. When Mrs. Uh, May does her thing at the Tory party conference, uh, entrepreneurship and all that, does she believe in it? Well, it doesn't really look mm. terribly genuine, does it? Um, so he's motivated by this stuff because he, he's died in the wool. On, on, on this stuff. He, you know, he's, he's born to this stuff almost. Um, and so people look at it and say, well, at last, like they do with Trump, at last, a politician who actually says it like it is, who, who, who will t talk about his own beliefs. And I think probably like Trump, they take him seriously, but not necessarily literally. I, I, I think that they, they think, yeah, you know, it, this is exactly what we believe in. Yeah, we, we know he wouldn't be able to do all this stuff, but yeah, he's absolutely right. Yeah, give, give, give them a shock. Eugenie. Oh, I really enjoyed the discussion, and my question's going to go back to Theresa May. Um, it's a deeply depressing <laughs> subject. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you mentioned um, the Tory manifesto in the lead-up to the, the election last year, and um, one thing that fascinates me about what's happening in Australia is politicians' fear of taking forward uh, so-called brave policies, particularly any sort of policy that will reduce the size of government or cut back sure. spending. Um, so, and, and there's a real reluctance for any policy to have what, what I term losers in it. Um, every policy needs to help everyone. Um, but the Tory manifesto included something that was controversially known as the dementia tax. And um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that, whether the Tory party just, that was a complete mess up in the way they sold it, or do you think there's fundamentally a problem with brave policy now? I think there is a, yes, I think there is a, a problem with uh, being brave. I think there always has been. I think it's got worse. And I think that it's got worse because of this change in democracy. We don't have democracy, we have populism. Uh, in fact, I, I'm th I, I, if I, might, I might actually do this. I've been thinking for some time of writing a little book called One Cheer for Democracy, uh, because democracy is a great system, but I don't <coughs> think that we have it anymore. I think we have populism. And uh, you know, partly I blame uh, Rupert Murdoch and the 24-hour news cycle, and, and they have to fill the 24-hour news cycle. So you get this unholy alliance between politicians and, and the media, uh, and, and that's, that, that's the whole discussion. And they all think that something should be done, instead of, you know, I think, no, don't do anything. It'll sort itself out. Um, so I, I, that, I think, that, I think, is our problem. I think we have a real problem with democracy, and it's almost you know, embarrassing to say this, but I really, I really do. And I think that we, we need to address it, and I think that we need sort of liberal thinkers like... Uh, Centre for Independent Study to, to be saying this and saying that democracy works provided it's limited and you need to respect people's rights and, and all that. So, so I think that's, that's part of it. Uh, James Bartholomew, whom I mentioned earlier, he'll be out here later in the year, uh, he's compiled a lot of polling data hmm. that shows that 70% uh, of British millennials, uh, these are folks primarily aged in their 20s and early 30s, yeah. they don't know who Mao Tse Tung is. 70% right. yeah. don't know who Mao Tse Tung is, yeah. and a majority, and, and the 30% who do know who Mao Tse Tung is, a majority of them think he was actually a pretty good bloke. Oh. <laughs> uh, one, other, one, other, one other astonishing bit of material that uh, James Bartholomew has uh, unearthed 
uh, is that uh, something like, uh, I'm not sure of the exact detail, but 59, 60, 62 percent of millennials think that George W. Bush killed more people than Joseph Stalin. Yeah. What is wrong with the British education system? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think, I think that things just move on. And, um, you know, I and uh, the ancient Greg over there uh, <laughs> both, both remember what it's it was still like. still here. <laughs> I remember going through Checkpoint Charlie in, in Berlin. Yeah. And you could see what it was like on the other, other side. And it was dire. And, and nobody would talk to you and all the rest of it. Everybody was living in fear, and it was drab and miserable, and there was nothing to do. Um, and uh, we remember that. Mm. I think young people, I mean, my, my kids don't remember that. They weren't, they weren't born there. I, I, I took them back to Berlin when they were smallish, and I said, well, you know, you can't see it now, but the wall was here, and, and it would trap pe people trapped behind. They said, well, why didn't people just jump over the wall? Said, oh, God, right, you know. Yeah. You know, if he'd seen it, you know, yeah. it was like about half a mile Mm, sure. wide with gun posts and barbed wire and you know chicanes and all the rest of it um, so uh, they've never experienced that and you know in the bar of King's College Cambridge over the bar is a hammer and sickle mm. and you think they just don't get it do they I mean, that flag killed about 80 million people yeah. Mao killed well yeah Mao killed you know another 40 uh, and people don't know that, which is why James Bartholomew, I'm glad to see he's coming here because he's doing a great job. He's trying to create this uh, online and then, then a, a, a real museum, uh, museum well. of, yeah. of communist terror mm. Uh, mm. to show people what it was like. And he's done some brilliant little videos. Oh. I, you know, I hope you can get them yep. and share them with yep. people. Absolutely. Um, just people talking about their experiences. under, And we need to do it now because these people are dying off. It's depressing, isn't it? It reminds one of uh, the Roman statesman Cicero's remark that uh, to ignore what happened before you were born is to always remain a child. <laughs> Next question. Yes, sir. Can we get the, video, uh, the audio here? Please? Just wait for the mic. Um, if I recall from the British election that I had last year and the commentary after that election, one of the things or one of the themes of that election that was talked about was that uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party were able to stitch a narrative together as to why people should vote for them, whereas mm. the Theresa May Conservatives were unable to stitch a narrative together. They weren't able to be convincing in anything. And I think to a certain extent, the Turnbull government in Australia has done exactly the same thing. They're unable to stitch a narrative together for why free market's good, why liberalism is good, why we should vote for them. So how do you believe, or do you believe that we can retake that narrative, that we can actually construct that narrative to make people vote for liberalism again? Or how do you think we can do it? I like a question from a, a man who's got bright socks like me. Um, <laughs> uh, look, I'm an, I'm an optimist on these things. I, I, th I think, you know, I, I have very little faith in po politicians. It's easier if you're in opposition, I have to say. Right, you're, you're in opposition, you can, you can stitch together a narrative and say, well, we could, we, we could spend more money on this and we could uh, you know, improve that and uh, we could get rid of all the tax uh, uh, concessions and, and, and give it to the poor and, and all of it. It's, it's easy to do that if you're in, uh, in opposition. If you're in government and you say that, then you know, certain people um, in, in think tanks are going to rip that to shreds. Um, because it's just nonsense. So, um, yeah, it, it is more difficult. And uh, 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 that means that, that any opposition can, can weave together a narrative much more easily, I think. Um, I remain optimistic. I mean, I, I think that we, there are many, many good uh, people in uh, the Conservative Party in, in Parliament. We've actually lost a few, I have to say. We've lost some very good ones who've we came in in, let's say, 2010 and so on, and just, oh, forget it, you know, this is hopeless, I hate this life, and, uh, you know, I'm not being lobby fodder and all the rest of it. So we've lost some good people. But at the same time, there still are some extremely good people who are liberal and sort of Austrian economist-type people in, in Parliament. So we need to work with those, and we're trying to work with those, to um, produce an alternative narrative. When you're in government, it's extremely difficult to do that because you can't say things that are outside the, the party line, that uh, a certain line mm. is agreed and every minister, a hundred of them right down in the government, 
um, are expected to support that. But that's one of the perils. Boris of the does it, yeah. yeah, well, he's an exception. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but the Westminster tradition is different from the American system in that regard, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The American system is much more uh, open and people say well, what they One like. final question. Um, hmm. Oh, yep, yep. Make it easy. Yep, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd just like to get your thoughts on um, conspiracy theories, fake news, and the internet. Um, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a cock-up theorist. I think most things are a cock-up. You know, when something goes wrong, um, it's usually a cock-up. You know, I've just seen it so often in, in politics, and uh, very rarely have I seen conspiracies. Um, the internet is interesting because, as you say, it, it, or you imply, it, it, it has the power to spread all sorts of uh, news, good and bad. I mean, I get lots of good, interesting, useful news from the internet, but, but also sometimes you look at things and you think, is that true? You know, is somebody winding me up here? So th there is a problem. And I think that is why, I, it's one of the reasons why I'm a believer in a representative government. I think, you, you know, you do actually need to elect people whose job it is to take um, long-term decisions about um, public life and, and, and the way we, we're, we're governed, rather than just leave, leave it to the mob, because I think there's all sorts of um, hopelessly inaccurate uh, information out there. So, um, again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. I mean, it's interesting how the... The, the internet has its own regulatory systems, and if you know, if you do, if I tweet something online and it's wrong, mm. I mean, everybody, you know, wow, you know, it's amazing <laughs> the, the flack you will get, and you think, oh gosh, right, I better pull that one then. Um, so yeah, it, doesn't it, does have a, it does, Trump, though, it does have a reality say. check. Well, Donald is Donald, isn't he? I mean, you know, he's a bit like <laughs> Boris, right? Everybody th just enjoys the spe It adds to the gaiety of the nation. I mean, people just enjoy <laughs> the spectacle. And, and I love it because it just, it just confuses everybody. It confuses the media. They just don't know how to treat Trump. And it, it confuses, you know, uh, Miss, Miss, uh, Kim and all these other people and, and the Chinese. It used to be the Chinese that were inscrutable. You would never know what they would do. Now it's Donald Trump. <laughs> 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 okay, now for the vote of thanks, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the stage uh, our founding executive director, uh, my predecessor and uh, colleague, uh, Greg Lindsay. Otherwise known as Ancient Greg, apparently. <laughs> 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 you know, when I've known Eamon, we worked it out 40 years probably yes, this yeah, year. Yeah. Uh, CIS is a little bit older. Um, Adam Smith Institute, about the same. Yeah, about the same. Yeah, yeah. we uh, both went to a meeting of the Montpellier Society in Hong Kong. Uh, <coughs> and we've both been through Checkpoint Charlie uh, when the, uh, the MPS meeting in Berlin in That's 1982. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, if you go, if you look outside before you get on, go down in the lift on the left-hand side. There's a chunk, a large chunk of the Berlin Wall, <laughs> with above it um, a graphic uh, that was taken. From the, I think Deutsche Bank or someone like that produced a, a book of graphics of the Berlin Wall, and there's this, I think it's the world in chains or something like that. So, I mean, if people come into this place, they get a little reminder as they go out. Mm. Uh, and I think the millennials and so forth, maybe the James Bartholomew exercise or whatever. Uh, will prove to be really something important. Like Eamon, I'm an optimist, but a lot of what he had to say was a little bit depressing. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> we can live with that, I suppose. Uh, looking back on, um, on uh, Jeremy Corbyn, and he said he, he hadn't quite read enough Marx or something. Well, if he comes here, <laughs> all, 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 all that stuff up there, uh, courtesy of the, the late Paddy McGuinness, who knew more about Marx than just about anybody, certainly Jeremy Corbyn. So, look, um, we've had a terrific discussion. One of the real takeaways for me, and it's something that's been occupying my mind for quite some time, is this problem of democracy. I agree with Eamon on his approach to it, but there are problems with it, and we need to figure out um, how to deal with it. There's a, the, there's a wonderful book uh, written by um, Micklethwaite and Woolridge called The Fourth Revolution. Mm. And in that, they describe the problem with democracy as a um, eat all you can, I think it's a term they use, an eat all you can democracy. There's no limits. So if, if my takeaway would be to go back to another great British Prime Minister, not uh, Theresa May or anybody else, or Thatcher, I'm quite happy to have her, but William Gladstone. Mm. Gladstone had a very good sense of what the limits of democracy were, what the limits of government were. So 
I think even after 40 years, Eamon, our tasks are not over. Um, ancient as we might be, uh, I think we're still pretty energetic. So uh, just to give him some courage and please join with me and thank <laughs> Eamon tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to the cold of the UK, so this might help. Yeah. Oh, yeah. thanks very much. <laughs> oh, lovely. Yes, just thank you. Uh, yeah, thank just you. a few bookkeeping uh, um, <laughs> issues oh, nice. here. Um, first, uh, we, are, we at the CIS are funded by good and sound people uh, such as yourselves. So we don't receive any tax dollars. Um, very rarely do we get money from corporations. We really receive our money and our funding from good people. Hmm. So any donation, however small, really helps us going to fight the good fight in these polarising uh, times. Uh, there's a membership form there. If you haven't become a member, please consider becoming one. Uh, secondly, I want to thank uh, PJ Shanmugan from Phillips Frolic Wines for donating the Aura Rose. Rose. Uh, James Halliday's Australian Wine Company uh, says that it is crisp, incisive. Its character stands out like a beacon, super spicy, super dry and super long in the finish and aftertaste. And you can always order a, a case uh, at philipsfrolic.com.au. Uh, and finally, up and coming events. Our next event uh, will be held uh, here in this room on Thursday week with Oliver Hartwich, a former senior fellow here at CIS. He's now head of the New Zealand Initiative, which is the equivalent of the Adam Smith Institute and CIS, but uh, in New Zealand. He'll be talking about the, th the threats and dangers posed by the interventionist economics agenda of Jacinta Ardern. And then something different, on March 6, we're heading out to the Rudy Hill, uh, sorry, the Castle Hill RSL. Uh, we're having a big debate uh, on India, free markets and Prime Minister Narendra Modi. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much and join me in thanking Eamon Butler. Oh, thank you. Thank you.